welcome to How I Got Here, the inside stories of startups and innovation in travel and transportation with your hosts, FocusWire's Kevin May and Mozio's David Litwack. Welcome to How I Got Here. That's Focuswire and Motio's weekly podcast where we talk to the innovators and entrepreneurs in travel, tourism, hospitality, and ground transportation. This week, we're delighted to welcome John Gusick. He's the uh, managing director of Australia based Webjet, which is the operator of the Webjet OTA and Webbeds, amongst other things, which is an accommodation wholesaler. His tenure at the top has seen the company make a number of major acquisitions, including Zuji, Jack Travel and Destinations of the World Group, as well as big brand sponsorships in the sporting world in the home country. Uh, John assumed the top job at Webjet in February 2011 after a five-year career at GTA, including Chief Commercial Officer and Managing Director of its Asia Pacific Division, amongst other things. So a very warm welcome to John. Thank you for joining us on How I Got Here. Uh, Thank you very much. As always, our first question for regular listeners will know is for you to tell us how you got here, John. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity, Kevin, and I'm uh, delighted to be part of your esteemed alumni and uh, and hopefully uh, out of the 65 you've done, when you do a poll afterwards, I won't be ranked number 65 in, uh, in interest value. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll try and ramp it up a little bit and give you something to, to work with. My tenure is an unusual one to get to to become the managing director of Webjet because what happened is predating my arrival in 2011, I had started my association back in 2003 with Webjet as I was at that time the managing director of a company called Galileo Australia that's morphed into something called Travelport. And back then, and probably not too different to currently, the the way that uh, GDSs uh, survive is to create uh, demand. And one of the ways that we created demand was to try and procure um, online travel agencies, which were in their infancy back in the back in the day, back in two thousand and and three. And what actually happened in my case and, and, and my association with Webjet is the founder of Webjet, a guy called David Clark, came to me in 2003 and said, I have the aspiration of wanting to build the world's greatest booking engine. I said, fabulous, David. It sounds like a very noble aspiration. I wish you all the best in that endeavor. I said, why are you here talking to me? He goes, I've got one problem. I go, what's that? I've got no money. I said, well, that's a, that's a big problem to have at this early stage in your tenure. So how can I help? He goes, well, I've gone to Microsoft and Microsoft have told us, and it's remarkable, even after all these years, I remember these numbers better than uh, I remember what pair of socks I put on this morning. But he comes to me and says, we, uh, Microsoft have quoted, uh, we need four and a half million dollars to build this, uh, this greatest uh, website. I've got one and a half. If you lend me one and a half, that'll give us three. And then we'll go to Microsoft and Microsoft, I think I can convince them to put in one and a half million dollars of sweat equity. And the reason I think I can convince them, it's 2003, remember, is that they've just launched the .NET framework and they're looking for a transactional internet site that will utilize all the capability of the framework. We will be a poster child for .NET innovation in 2003, and I think I can get it done. So after a little bit of uh, wrangling, I, uh, I did give him $1.5 million, and we took 20% equity in Webjet, and we took a copy of the code, not to be used in competition, but to, in, in the B2C environment, but to be used as um, in our B2B GDS intermediary space. So we did the deal. And then from 2003 through to late 2005, I was a board observer and Webjet were a publicly listed company. And the reason I was a board observer is um, we wanted to make sure they didn't run away with our money. And they were actually spending it on the OTA and not on uh, other jollies that uh, internet companies were spending it on back then. And... In 2005, we successfully completed the project, two-year 
uh, deal that was completed. Microsoft were delighted. Uh, Webjet started picking up market share once it released its product into the market. There are things that it does today that no other OTA um, has replicated. And uh, my tenure came to an end at Webjet when the parent company, which was Galileo, that subsequently became Sendent back in 2006, sold our 20% stake at a handsome profit. Everyone walked away happy. And I thought that would be the beginning and the end of my association with Webjet. And then what happened was about six months later, they asked me to come back and become a, uh, a, a board member wearing long pants so I could actually uh, do things. So I, got, I filled a casual vacancy as a, as a board member, as a non-executive director. I was still working, as you mentioned, for GTA at that stage. And I stayed as a non-executive director until the end of 2010 when David Clark retired and he asked me to become the managing director. So I, I took the reverse journey, which is becoming uh, uh, a partner, Ned, non-executive director, to become the managing director. So that's how I got here. Hey, thank you very much for that. Um, uh, very entertaining as well. I mean, something to pick up on there. I, I didn't know the Microsoft kind of code story that you referenced at the beginning which is perhaps all the more remarkable given that Microsoft created Expedia back in the day. Well, you, uh, I was gently going to skirt around that issue, um, <laughs> primarily because that was the reason we went to, my, uh, to Microsoft. We said, you have some recent experience. Have you heard of a thing called of an OTA? Of course you have. You have some recent experience. In fact, you owned one until very, very recently. How would you like to build a better one? That was our pitch to Microsoft. So uh, nice pickup. Right. Okay. So, um, yeah, lots to unravel here, I suppose, then, John. So I, I, I'm interested in that period when you were a, a, a board member wearing short pants, if we yep. can, before you've got your long pants. And um, what were your kind of observations on the way the business was being run? you know, in that kind of role where you didn't have any kind of hands-on operational um, kind of influence as such. And how did that kind of evolve over those intervening kind of eight years before you actually did get your hands on the business as the, as, as the person at the top, as it were? Well, it's, it's, it's um, an interesting dynamic because you have to cast your mind back 20 years to what the world was looking like at, the, at that particular point in time. And it isn't the world that the internet's evolved into, which is in many ways, a replication of traditional oligopoly industries where it's dominated by uh, one to two major players in each, sec in each segment or each sector. And back then, you know, I'm thinking back to when we uh, started building the, uh, the .NET engine for Webjet, Back then, you know, our competitors were brand names that have all disappeared that were many times larger than Webjet. They were travel.com, .au, and What If. And um, I don't know if you've heard of this company called Priceline, but they came to Australia and did a joint venture with the telco, the Australian telco, that was an abject failure. And, you know, there were many, many people coming into the space because it was a little bit like, and you know, I'm sure this will be, the analogy is no surprise, a little bit like the Wild West. Everyone was staking out their claim and, uh, and, and, and searching for gold. And, you know, I, I, we entered into the, uh, the transaction with Webjet as, on behalf of Galileo at the time with a high degree of scepticism because there would have been a, a significant chance that it would have failed and we would never have got uh, a return on the 20% stake. We were undercapitalized. Webjet was an undercapitalized business compared to all those that I just mentioned previously who had um, much deeper pools of, of capital behind them. Webjet had made uh, an outrageous decision in 1999 to, um, to list on the Australian Stock Exchange, and it listed on the Australian Stock Exchange before it had revenues. Now, you just wouldn't do that, but it was the internet boom of the, the late 90s, and it, it, it enabled that business to, to get some uh, capital behind it and some liquidity and enabled it to compete. So my, my thinking is different from when I was at from 2003 to 2005, 2006 timeframe, because we were just establishing ourselves as a serious player. 
and emerging from the ruck of, uh, you know, people crawling out of the swamp, trying to, 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 to develop a vertebrae. And we were part of that, uh, part of the, what could have been a number of winners. But fortunately for us, we, we got some traction and continued to grow. From 2006 onwards, when I was a board member, I was astonished at the clarity of thought of the founder in trying to build out the most efficient um, OTA in the world. And we were for many years. We, you know, when I, when I inherited the business, we had a, a turnover and I'll do, the, do everything in Australian dollars just to show that this is a multicultural uh, podcast that we're running here that we were turning over roughly, you know, 600 million in TTV um, in our entire business. And we had about 60 employees. So, you know, I used to joke the first days I arrived at, uh, at, at Webjet is that if you're not bringing in $10 million of TTV, what are you doing here? So, you know, we, we, we had a very singular purpose and incredible focus. And in that incredible focus, it was all about efficiency and building the brand. And that were the two things that I thought were compelling and very different to every other travel brand in the world. So you mentioned in your introduction, uh, we did some sports sponsorships. It, it goes to our pervasive sense that we didn't want to feed Google and be reliant on the last click. And at that stage, that was the prevailing orthodoxy of virtually every OTA in the world. I remember, um, you know, we would spend money building brand ads and everyone's going, but you've got hardly any money. Why are you building a brand when you could be doing a Google ad and getting a, a transactional revenue uh, in that you know, potential moment? And the answer we kept giving everybody was, we don't want to keep paying for the same traffic. We want the traffic to come to us organically. We want to be the leader in the brand, in the category. We want the brand to stand out for some values. And as a consequence, we think we'll be better positioned for the long haul. And 20 years later and 10 years after that, those conversations, that's still the prevailing uh, mentality behind the business. It's still the prevailing way we view competition. And we're happy to go against the grain in, 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 in doing things that the rest of the market doesn't do. Now, I'll have to say that everybody else now plays the brand card. I'm not suggesting we're by ourselves, but we certainly were the first. And uh, it's contributed to our market leading position is as an OTA in Australia and New Zealand. I think what's quite interesting about that period, you know, the, uh, the early to mid 2000s, where you personally had probably quite an interesting juxtaposition where you were um, a board member of this fairly agile up and coming OTA taking risks doing all that but you also had a day job working for a GDS which yep. perhaps some might argue is the opposite of that kind of mentality I mean <laughs> and, and for those that are listening you're uh, smiling quite a lot I mean I, I, I wonder how you kind of juggled that I mean was it quite interesting to see what the new thing was doing and perhaps learn from what some of the old legacy company that you were working from and perhaps how you would apply those two together? Well, I think I need to give you an A-plus, Kevin, in political doublespeak when you were suggesting yeah. that it might be the opposite of a GDS. I, I, I don't think anybody in the history of mankind would argue that a GDS is agile. I, I, I would be, uh, I, I'd be questioning their sanity. Uh, I'm just but... doing the unbiased journalist thing, you know, right? <laughs> Well, congratulations. You made me chuckle. Um, so to, 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 the, to the point, we, were, we couldn't have been diametrically more opposite um, as businesses. Uh, Webjet um, was founded by uh, a really interesting guy, in David Clark. Uh, you know, in many ways, he's an incongruous founder of a, uh, of a startup because he did it in his 50s. He decided in the 50s, this internet thing's going to take off. It's going to be important. And he left a, a pretty lucrative uh, position, um, one of the you know, stalwarts of the, the old bricks and mortar retail distribution and corporate network in Australia, a company called Jet Set Travel, and, um, which still exists as part of the Hello World family today in, in various guises. But uh, he left that to, to start this business 
and in, in conjunction with two or three key employees made decisions on the fly and, and, and you hear all the, the case studies of how people operate today and, you know, experiment till you, you know, fail fast. And before all these things were slogans and, uh, and, and, and tattoos on, on, on your shoulders, uh, these things were real in, in the Webjet environment. Now, the GDS environment was uh, a heavily structured, meticulously planned, um, forecast-driven modeling that um, would try to innovate by putting 33 people into a room and talking about themselves and their uh, political aspirations. And very, very occasionally, they might even think of a customer and what the customer actually wants in all of this. So it was remarkably different how those two businesses operated. And one had uh, uh, a mantra that, you know, it's a legacy business, it's integrated into the very fabric of the travel ecosystem. And it had um, a, a shelf life that was infinite because it was important and others was a disruptor that was thinking, what can I do today that I wasn't doing yesterday? So they couldn't have been more different. And, you know, it suited my semi-schizophrenic personality to participate in, uh, in both elements of that uh, spectrum. Well, David here, thanks, John, for, for joining us. I appreciate it. Um, there's a bunch of things we touched on here that I wanted to dive deeper into. So first, you, you mentioned how you know, Microsoft supported you. And it's almost like there was a golden age of corporate entrepreneurship support back 20 years ago. If you know, Microsoft helped build Expedia, you guys helped uh, you know, at Galileo help build Webjet. I don't feel like that happens really much anymore. And what was it about those early years? You know, you know, either was it the travel industry being so nascent? Was it that some of these players would needed to support, like you know, the GDS is needed to support an OTA to prove their existence in some way, or or to to get a competitive positioning? There there just seemed to be different incentive structure back then than there is now. Could you know, like, what do you, why do you think that's changed? I'll start by saying I don't know if it really has changed i just think the, the the legacy time frame that you're talking about gives greater clarity in what evolved and and and, and occurred as a consequence of decisions that were made i'll roll forward um, two other decisions that we made in conjunction with microsoft that um, have been groundbreaking for us and you know we're not acolytes of microsoft by by any by any stretch but remarkably for a corporation, and you know, this is going to date when we uh, when we we did our uh, did our podcast on the day after Bill and Melinda announced their separation. Uh, Microsoft uh, has been uh, has played a pivotal role in two major um, decisions that we made in the business. So, if I roll forward to two thousand and eleven, you know, I've just taken over, and I'm thinking about what are the things that are going to be groundbreaking that are going to define the business over the next 10 years and what are the things that are more efficiency led that are going to help us compete and a conclusion i came to by the end of 2011 was that i thought the cloud was going to be important in how we were going to um, provide greater scalability and a high level of speed to the development of our uh, tech platforms. So we're still on the .NET platform, .NET platform by that stage, and we build out a cloud-based solution. So we did that with Microsoft. Um, we started that conversation with them in 2011. Azure was released, I think, from memory early 2012. And by the time we completed the project in 2013, we were the first ATA in the world that had moved uh, onto the cloud. and you know, there was a, a big behemoth in Microsoft who are, you know, a million miles away from Australia and Seattle to us, but were very, very helpful in, in, in doing all of that. And we, we did that because we, we have invested in, you know, significant relationships that have been the mainstay of the way that we've operated our business because we're a little bit counter, I think we're counter, counter cyclical or counter culture wise to what everybody else tends to do. We don't go to trade shows. We don't, uh, we don't go to, sorry, talk fests where there are, you know, various other industry people talking about everything everyone should know in the industry. We, we tend to do that behind closed doors. So Microsoft were helpful in that. And then in 2017, we went to Microsoft and, you know, we, we pitched an idea and said, uh, 
you, you're, you're building out Ethereum. We'd like to build something on Ethereum. We think blockchain is going to be, um, you know, as part of the, the digital economy going forward, digital assets and the digitization of the world. We think blockchain plays an important part in building trust between parties. And we'd like to build a solution. So we, we talked to them over a considerable period of time about building something. And, you know, we were super excited about it. And they, they, they sort of put us into a series of competitions. So we won the best idea in Australia and then we won the best idea in, uh, in Asia. They invited us to Seattle to pitch the story to, 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 to the guy leading the blockchain business in Seattle. And so we were super excited, but we're also thinking, oh, how are we going to differentiate ourselves? But these are Americans we need to talk to now. We're, we're, we're talking to uh, the heavy hitters of, of innovation. So um, we'll stand out by doing something, you know, completely cheesy and cute, like uh, wear iHeart blockchain uh, T-shirts, iHeart Ethereum T-shirts. We gave them M&Ms with I love blockchain written all over them. I don't know how you can write that on an M&M, but we, we did all that sort of stuff. I remember coming in, introducing ourselves, introducing my team to the guy, and he ignored all the paraphernalia, ignored all the M&Ms, and just went straight to, is this problem going to solve uh, transaction ish trust issues in, in the travel sector? We said, yeah, he goes, fine, you've got our full support. So our, our preparation of, uh, of, of, of many weeks and, and, and days getting ready for this pitch was sort of over and done with in five minutes. So I, I think big companies like Microsoft um, try to pick winners and, and try to pick uh, businesses they can support. It's just that in five years' time, you'll hear the story. And hopefully our blockchain solution in five years' time is a compelling part of, of our value proposition and, and, and it will have its nascent uh, days back in, uh, back in me wearing too tight white T-shirt. Wow. Well, what's funny is that um, I think that I've had an almost opposite uh, kind of learning curve from coming from Silicon Valley where everyone operates exactly like that to the travel industry where everyone's had a really long-term relationship building. <laughs> and um, I think for me, I might come in as like, we're the best solution. And they'll go, yes, but like, you know, we haven't, we don't know you get to know, like get, get to know us. And it's, um, you know, I think it's definitely a, uh, you know, there's cultural differences uh, there for sure. I wanted to touch on something else you said. Um, you mentioned oligopolies, like back in the day when you started, you know, the internet wasn't full of oligopolies. I think, you know, a, a big topic of conversation in our industry is the kind of duopoly of Expedia and Booking.com and how much, you know, uh, you know, power they have as they snatched up many of those brands. I think what, what Tiff, you mentioned earlier, right, it was snatched up by Expedia, if I'm not mistaken. And, you know, obviously uh, Booking and Priceline have snatched up a bunch as well. And, you know, uh, how do you think about, the current internet infrastructure, uh, internet landscape as it re relates to the travel industry and how you guys compete in it and and how do you compete in a world where there's consolidating you know more and more power consolidating in those two two uh, players hands it's it's um it's the it's it's a politically dynamite uh, question that you've just asked and um it, it depends on where you are in the uh in the travel sphere and how you elect to compete and partner with the brands that you've just mentioned, they will clearly influence uh, what your current thought processes are. So I'll start high level and then break it down to how I think Webjet fits into it. Um, as an OTA, it's game over. You know, bookings and Expedia have won. It, 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 there's no competition. That this 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 game has been played and 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 the results just determined. It's just who's going to grow uh, faster. Out of that, out of that uh, pie of OTAs. Now, Webjet has has carved out a, a niche position in, in Australia and New Zealand, where we are the uh, the largest player in the airspace, and you know we're, we're bigger than the than the one brand that sells air consistently. Um, and obviously, that the other one doesn't compete with us on the air side um, overtly. So there there, are, there will be players, there will be opportunities for niche players, but uh, over time. You know, size is a competitive advantage. You know that that maxism held true uh, in 1950, and it still holds true today. So that that isn't going to change. So in in a in a homeostatic state, there's there's nothing that anyone can do to change that dynamic. Now, where 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 the interest is, and while we all get out of work, get up in the morning to get to work. Sorry, is uh, is is how can we change how can we change the rules of the game? Because playing the same game ain't going to get you anywhere. So I think that as, 
as uh, online agencies have successfully usurped the, the traditional demand of, of, of offline agencies, there needs to be a, uh, another revolution that gives uh, somebody else the opportunity of becoming the most significant player in the market. And there are plenty, without getting into specifics, there are plenty of people who are, who are, playing, on, who are playing on that edge. And, uh, and I think blockchain will be uh, one of the things that potentially undoes the historic power of intermediaries in distribution. Can I ask a follow-up question on that specifically around blockchain? So it's funny, I think there's sometimes, there's a lot of debate about blockchain and its usefulness. And I, I feel like sometimes there's a mistake that people make where they say, you know, blockchain will remove the need for intermediaries and they don't necessarily understand which intermediaries will be uh, will be removed, meaning like they'll say, well, we don't need Uber anymore, forgetting that like, you know, 95% of what Uber does is onboarding drivers and all these other different things that like blockchain will have nothing to do with. And I imagine a lot of what WebJet does is, you know, onboarding new hotel companies and, you know, that blockchain might not have anything to do with. Um, you know, I think that there's this, this idea that like, it's because it, it's going to solve certain trust issues around payments Therefore, OTAs won't be necessary anymore. You were an OTA who's enthusiastic about blockchain. You must have a more subtle perspective on that. How do you view blockchain and travel actually, you know, jiving together? I I view it in the context of um, if you if you if you're going to if you're going to be eaten, you may as well eat yourself. And uh, to that 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 sense of uh, of uh, filial cannibalism is 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 something that you're better served by playing multiple hands rather than a single hand. And you know, I, I I'll go back to you know one of the probably 2012 back in the in the days of Webjet, where you know I'd come to the board and presented the the, the following hypothesis: we. We, we're a landlocked country and eventually we'll run out of growth as primarily a seller of air tickets in Australia and New Zealand. And I'm sure your uh, well-educated audience knows the combined population of the two markets is 30 million, which is uh, you know, less than 10% of uh, the United States. So it's a small market. So firstly, do we, do we think we have global aspirations? I certainly do. And they go, yep, we have global aspirations. Excellent. So there are two things that uh, I think we should make a bet on. One is that um, we can build uh, and we can utilise the technology that we've got in Australia and deploy that successfully overseas. And in the introduction, Kevin you know, skillfully wove in uh, that we made the acquisition of Zuji. Um, so... That was the bet that we took in, in acquiring Zuji. And we thought, well, if we're successful in Australia and New Zealand, there's no, there's no reason that we can't replicate that success in Hong Kong and Singapore and use that as a springboard to Asia. Well, we couldn't have been more wrong. We were complete failure in, 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 in that entire strategy. And, uh, and, and that didn't work. And at the same time, the second bet we made was um, hotel distribution um, is painful for everybody um, in, in, in the cycle. And can we contribute? to providing um, the broadest range of inventory to partners with the least amount of pain. And that was the, the start of what is now called Webbeds. But back then, you know, we launched in the Middle East with a business called Lots of Hotels. And it's had a, um, a highly successful journey over the last uh, eight years to, to get to where we are or to where we were pre-pandemic. So my, my view coming back to, to your specific question is, is no different to that. In 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 in, uh, in in where Webjet sits, we have a traditional OTA, and we compete very very hard to continue to grow our share. But it doesn't mean we're oblivious to what other opportunities are out there. So, a couple of months ago, we made an acquisition of twenty five percent in a blockchain based OTA called Locktrip. Now it's a minority position in in a business that um, has built out uh, not only an OTA. Uh, built on, blo on, on, on blockchain, but it's an OTA that's built its own Ethereum equivalent called Hydra. So we like the technology play that that gives and gives us an opportunity to look at where does that take us along that journey of competing in a different space to the traditional OTAs. 
And on the same front, it doesn't mean that the web beds business, which has historically been um, uh, a traditional wholesaler model, can't be revolutionized from the inside by using blockchain technology to change the, the way that we interact with our suppliers and our partners. And we're in the midst of uh, rolling that out more broadly. At the moment, we do it internally, and it's been part of driving our costs down. And it's been part of the reason why we've been the low cost leader in that particular segment. But there's no, there's no reason why we can't expand that to everybody else in the travel portfolio to provide them with the same level of efficiency. So we've got plans that encompass our legacy, which is our OTA model, our emerging business, which is our B2B model. And, you know, uh, I, I appreciate your, 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 your question, which is well crafted. There is um, plenty to think about of how blockchain becomes commercialized and becomes the regular, um, that, that becomes a regular part of all of our day-to-day -day consumer led lives. But that's coming and it's coming rapidly. And in the next five to 10 years, you know, the, 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 the blockchain digital asset environment is at the same stage as where the internet was in about 1999. And we roll forward 20 years and I have no doubt we'll be reflecting back on this conversation as I was, gee, I wonder if WebJet's gonna do any good in this, uh, this uh, .NET application that we're about to launch. Yeah, no, I mean, so don't get me wrong. Like, so I consider myself to be a, a moderate when it comes to <laughs> blockchain. I'm, I'm definitely not a skeptic, but I'm not an enthusiast, I'd say either. And, you know, I've been paying attention to a lot of the NFT stuff. And, you know, I, I think that I think blockchain is most interesting when it creates a marketplace for something that doesn't exist, like a, a new marketplace for art or something like that in NFTs. And that seems to be something that's interesting. But I think what I'm struggling with in the travel industry, and I want to kind of, you know, maybe rephrase my question a little bit here is like, what's the value in travel? So, I mean, looking at Lock Trips website, for example, there's no like it's not obvious from the the website like why blockchain is advantageous to us like i don't have trouble paying on expedia or webjet right i don't have trouble you know doing these things you guys solve most of those problems for me and yep. it, it, there's it, it, it blockchain is not creating a marketplace that doesn't exist as is evidenced by how many otas we have out there right that marketplace does exist and a lot of the problem in fact it, you know in in creating that marketplace it has nothing to do with blockchain it's to do with plugging into special fares and being able to upsell on seats and you know and and like interfacing into different airline systems and stuff and uh, my, my that's always been my struggle with kind of like <clears throat> trying to figure out the blockchain like angle and travel so like is there like one particular thing that you look at like lock trip and go this is going to unlock a lot of value for webjet and you know, or the future that we can't do ourselves without blockchain um i look at it a little bit um less concrete than the the question that you've asked and i'm not avoiding the question but i'm happy to take a strategic punt in a business that is emerging from a, a marketplace that is highly fragmented at this early stage and consolidation never really will occur, but it will occur over the next five to 10 years. And if you don't have a horse in the race, you have no chance of winning that race. I'm happy to be a participant at this early stage and hopefully create um, some of those marketplaces you're describing because our, our thought process and is, has merged in the last 12 months from historically we we were very narrow in our definition of ourselves we're a digital travel business we have a b2c division and a b2b division but we know travel and we're online and we're pretty good at integrating disparate technology feeds and make it a compelling uh, proposition to either consumers or our travel partners okay that sustained us for 20 years um, now i don't know the answer specifically to the question you're asking today but I'm willing to no different to how we built our .NET solution, how we thought about blockchain, how we thought about moving to the cloud, how we thought about moving uh, 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 an Australian OTA to start a, a B2B business headquartered in Dubai. I'm, I'm willing to experiment and, and, and play because if I don't, I know I'll be left behind. And you know, if, if we don't do anything, the value that we create to our shareholders is substantially diminished. And you know, we're, we're a decent sized market cap and we have, uh, by Australian standards, and we have, you know, a significant pool of liquidity because uh, notwithstanding everything that's occurred to, to our businesses over the course of the last 12 months, 
investor confidence remains strong in, in, in the brand and, and we have had a, a great track record prior to, to 2020. So in light of all of that, people are still willing to say, yeah, we'll give you money. We know that, uh, that, that, that the market will evolve and we want you to be at the forefront of that. that that's my uh, non-confrontational answer and non-specific answer <laughs> to a very specific question. Thanks. Uh, just to end the uh, the blockchain related uh, uh, discussion, maybe the maybe we can tokenize this particular episode of how I got here and do an Sell NFT. An NFT, absolutely, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but only if the survey shows that I was in the top fifty percent of participants so far. I don't in the bottom fifty and tokenize as a. <laughs> we're, we're running oh, the Hunger Games process after this to determine the winner for sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Changing gears a little bit, I want to go back to something that you said earlier, and whether it was a throwaway comment or not, I don't know. You said, we were, for many years, the most efficient. And I wondered, one, what were you the most efficient at? And two, why did you stop being the most efficient? Uh, it wasn't a throwaway line. It was, um, it was um, inculcated into my brain as part of being a non-executive director that um, our competitors had buckets of money and we didn't. And therefore everything we had to do was to, to build out efficiency. So it was out of necessity. It wasn't out of, um, out of philosophy. It wasn't out of uh, this is, this is the, the mantra that we will live by, but it became the mantra that defined us for a significant period of time. So when you say we were the most efficient, um, you know, we, we were, we were, we were first in putting robotics into, into, into our ticketing. There were lots of things that we were, we were using our IT team and they're all about efficiency at the back end so that the manual intervention, notwithstanding that OTA is meant to be an entirely seamless online transaction. It, it, it isn't always, and there are always exceptions. And it, and it depends on how willing you are to forsake the purity of being an OTA with the, uh, the, the, the allure of, but if we captured this segment and we did this following thing outside of the normal process, it would be attractive uh, to, uh, it would be an attractive return. Uh, we, we, we didn't do that. You know, we were back in the day, if you remember again, 15 years ago, um, many OTAs took phone bookings um, and some, some, some do today as, as, a, as a, you know, they've come back in vogue in the last five years. We've never taken a phone booking. No, if they, yeah, our job you want you we we'll give you customer service, but that's after you've transacted. It's a self service booking tool that uh, we we encourage you to, to to take on board. So back in uh, back in uh, 2011, 600 million dollars of TTV and uh, 60 60 employees. We roll forward to 2020, and um, I can roll forward. To, I'll, I'll roll forward to 2020 because that was um, you know a, a relevant number. Our employee number had gone from 60 to 2,500 and our turnover had gone from 600 million to 4.5 billion. So we got completely out of whack and, and it was a deliberate strategy because we knew that in a B2B world, it just doesn't scale as beautifully as it does in the OTA world. It's, it scales nicely and we, we, we take great pride in that we are the low cost provider, but it doesn't have marketing and very little else as the scaling com uh, combination that uh, an OTA does. So for all of those reasons, we have become, yeah, it's no longer a, a metric. If, you don't, if you're not bringing me $10 million of TTV, don't come to work. I can't even make that joke anymore because it, it's, it's, it's barely a million dollars of TTV, but um, uh, it's $2 million. So, uh, yeah, our, our metrics have all gone haywire but our profitability has gone from 10 million bucks to, or whatever it was, I, I forget now, but I think it was 10 million bucks to 160 uh, pre-pandemic. So we had a 16-fold increase, notwithstanding that we added costs. Now, the beauty of what was happening at that point in time is we were just getting to scale. And at scale on a B2B business, we would have continued to grow, albeit at a slower rate. Let's say we grew 20 or 30% but our costs would have only grown five to 10% and our EBITDA margin would have expanded. So we would have had um, uh, an increasingly more profitable business, which would have been great, but uh, the, world, the world turned on a dime and, and we are where we are. And, 
and and we need to reinvent ourselves to to operate uh, for 2025, not for uh, my, my my vision of 2025 and back in 2020. And to, there have been lots of acquisitions during your time as MD. Can you identify which, on reflection, is probably the most important one? And maybe it is Zuji because you referenced it earlier, but and the least successful one. So most important acquisition and least successful acquisition. Uh, least successful, I, I like to focus on failure. So least successful was <laughs> Zuji. Um, we, uh, we, we bought that business. Um, it was losing $5 million a year. We paid $25 million US for it. Um, and you know, you can't work out the multiple of that, Kevin, I know you're trying to, it's not going to happen. <laughs> and we, we did it with the hubris that we could replace their technology, implement Webjet methodologies and make that a significantly profitable business. We worked really, really hard on that business for three years and we were successful in getting it to sub $1 million of profitability. Um, the only thing that saved us was that we were able to sell that business uh, for $60 million, which may sound like a great deal, but it was three years of wasted effort and, uh, and we, we, we didn't achieve any of our strategic objectives. So that was clearly the most, uh, the least successful. Uh, let, me just, let me just jump in before you talk about your most important one. You said you worked on it for three years, but did you have, how quickly into that three years did you realise that, oh, crap, we might have a bit of a problem here? <laughs> if, 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 you know, I always, you know, I, I, as, as anyone who's worked with me over the years knows, I have uh, buyer's remorse in the elevator <laughs> the way down from signing the deal. So I don't know how long it was from the, the lawyer's office where we signed to where the elevator and about halfway down the 40-storey the, the building, but I figure that's probably two minutes is when I first started thinking, what have I done? Uh, but realistically, probably closer to 12 months in when we broke even 12 months and I was struggling to see a pathway to, to get to the, uh, the profit objectives that were in the business case that I presented to the board. So that was uh, that that was a lot of explaining to do, uh, you know, afterwards to to, to the board. Um, on the the B two B and look, we bought another B two C business which we're happy with called Online Republic in two thousand sixteen. Yep. We're a, a market leader in, in motorhomes and cars uh, in in Australasia. It's a good business, but it wasn't transformative to 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 the overall Webjet enterprise. Um, if I go back to, you know, 2012, I, I convinced the board to, 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 to launch a B2B business in the Middle East, and we launched that in 2013. So nine months later, after, um, after starting the journey, we did. And nine months after that, we broke even towards the end of 2013, which was great. And then we made a very small acquisition of a business called Sun Hotels, uh, based in Palma, Mallorca which has given me the, uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity for living part-time of the year in Palma, Mallorca. Thank, thanks for that acquisition. Um, and within three years, it was, it, was, it was a great business. It was a niche B2B business, but within three years, organically, we'd uh, doubled, doubled our TTV and substantially grown the, uh, the profit of that business. And we did that all organically. And on the back of that acquisition, it gave us the confidence and the board, the confidence, and most importantly, our shareholders, the confidence to support us in the acquisition of Jack in 2016, and then the acquisition of DOTW in 2018. And those two things gave us uh, scale, and they made us global and meaningful uh, businesses. So neither of those two acquisitions, which we're very happy with, would have occurred if we hadn't have had, you know, earned our chops in, uh, in building out the Sun Hotel business organically as we did. Okay, so our last question then, unfortunately, John, I suspect and fear we could have talked for a couple more hours. This has been terrific, but uh, time is, uh, is, is against us. But I am curious on a culture question. So um, we've interviewed lots of Silicon Valley startups. We've interviewed lots of European established companies, American companies. Um, David may well correct me if I'm wrong here. I think this is the first Australian company and Australian 
uh, leader of a company that we've uh, that we've interviewed for how I got here. Is there anything about the culture of the company that is particularly Australian compared to say, you know, you know, the people at Microsoft and presumably lots of people at Expedia and other OTAs around the world and travel businesses. What is it that's unique about the culture of Webjet, if there is anything unique about it? I, I would be, um, I'd be an abject failure if I hadn't uh, created in that uh, enabled us to succeed and culture is the number one ingredient that provides that environment for success. So, you, you know, I, I rather tactlessly and a little bit tongue-in-cheek gave my uh, example of a, of a GDS environment earlier on in the conversation. And I'll say with, uh, it, it gave me a, a little bit of inspiration of what not to do when I started uh, my tenure. So, you know, I, I did things that aren't particularly revolutionary by today's standards, and we have backtracked from many of these. But back in the day, no PowerPoints, no emails more than one page, um, um, no meetings that go for more than an hour. Um, we needed to be action orientated, all of those sorts of things. Now, you know, 11, 11 years later, I'm desperate for a PowerPoint because if someone's just rambling, I just don't get it anymore. So we, we're, we're, we're backed away from all of that. Um, um, we'll, never, we'll, never, we'll never hire uh, an HR person. Um, you know, people, people management is the responsibility of the leaders in the business. They're the most important asset that we have. We don't need a third party um, getting involved. We need to have open and honest communication continuously so that people know where they stand and we don't have the horror show that is a, 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 an annual or a semi-annual performance appraisal, which is just perversity in the making. So uh, I, I never understood that. And we still don't do parts of what I just described. We certainly don't do a performance appraisal. That would just be, um, I can't think of anything um, more counterproductive to, 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 to getting people to, to wanting to produce so then I think about, you know, what, what is it, the culture that, that, that we want? And, you know, and, and I'll come back to you, how did we get here and, and, and what are the things that are important to us? Um, number one, I think, is um, open-mindedness. Um, you talk about us being an Australian business. Um, we, we don't have, we're Australian only in this sense. We have um, uh, our office of record uh, as a publicly listed company is in Melbourne, Australia. Apart from our finance function, we have no centralised functions anywhere in the world. We're a highly decentralised organisation. Um, and that's part of the mantra that I started the business, that I didn't like the ivory tower mentality that I'd seen in so many large corporates where um, uh, a little bit like uh, Big Brother, he knows best because uh, he's read about it and typically he's read about it in a... In a uh, in an ac academic encycl encyclopedia that uh, is obsolete the day it's published, we we you know we we were somebody that was focused, and and I don't want to give the impression we're anti intellectuals. We, we we love reading and we love being curious, but um, we we like the the cut and thrust of meeting people and being uh, being in meetings with suppliers and customers and drawing our uh, not so much our inspiration for for what we're trying to achieve, but drawing. The, uh, the, the problem solving capability from what we hear are the pain points from our clients and our, and our consumers that we deal with. So, and then that role, so you know, what, what are the things that we do at Webjet that are really specific, which you probably heard a million times, but we take it pretty literally. Um, you got to get a great team, great, great group of people to support you. I, I think we've done that particularly well over the journey. Um, lots of people have been with us a long time continue to be highly motivated, engaged and, and, and compelled to, to winning, which is uh, an, under, an underlying ethos of the business. We don't take ourselves too seriously, no different to this interview. Um, we like to have fun. And as I'm sure uh, anyone who has spent any time with us knows that we spend a lot of time eating and drinking after hours. And uh, we find that's a good way uh, to achieve um, uh, a fun environment, but most importantly, one in which people are free to to, to express themselves and uh, 
and and have have conversations that you just don't do in a, in a buttoned up corporate environment where uh, compliance to predetermined expectations of human behaviour dictate uh, how you should behave. And yeah, you know, we're we're a lot more relaxed than all of that. Okay, there's a a, a good note to end on. So, uh, and I'm based on what you said, just acutely conscious of meetings going longer than an hour so uh, <laughs> so there, so there we go we, we are shorter than the hour so we've kept in your good books uh john uh Gusick, thank you so much for joining us on how i got here this week thank you kevin pleasure to be here Okay, so uh, those tuning in, you've come to the end of another episode of How I Got Here. That's Focuswire and Mozio's weekly podcast where we talk to the innovators and entrepreneurs in travel, tourism, hospitality and ground transportation. If you are not a subscriber, then why the hell not? But anyway, if you are not a subscriber, please go and subscribe to How I Got Here at all the usual places. That's Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Alexa and Amazon and all those usual places. We're on all the platforms that you can think of. So go on there, subscribe, give us a review. We'd love to hear what you think. Uh, once again, from David and I, thanks ever so much to John for joining us. And as always, thank you very much for tuning in and we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to the How I Got Here podcast. We'll be back next week with more inside stories behind startups and innovation in travel and transportation. Check mozio.com slash move for a complete write-up of the highlights of every podcast with translations into five languages. And get your daily dose of news on the digital travel economy by subscribing to the newsletter at focuswire.com. See you next week.